So, uh, good afternoon and good morning from Dubai and good morning from India, Hyderabad. Okay, so thank you for uh, joining this the last panel discussion today, our uh, last uh, breakout session today. The theme is uh, management, uh, purpose, purpose in management. And I'd like to say two points at the beginning. First point, the purpose itself is not new, right? For example, Unilever, already 10 years ago, uh, Paul Pullman, the uh, uh, legend CEO, launched the sustainable living plan and started to innovate the company, right? Already 10 years project started. And one more thing, uh, purpose itself is a very popular keyword in management. Maybe everybody knows the uh, purpose, right? But today, uh, the purpose of this session is how from purpose to performance, right? I'd like to ask one question. Maybe you people, your company have already defined the purpose. And many of you are trying to realize the purpose, right? But I'd like to ask a question to the audience here, right? Are you confident? Please, please raise your hand whether you are confident that the purpose is contributing to the performance, right? So this is the theme of this panel, from purpose to performance. So please raise your hand. Your company's purpose is contributing to the, the performance, whatever. Please raise your hand. Oh. <laughs> Many people, thank you very much. So maybe you come to this place <laughs> instead of audience. Okay, so please raise your hand. Uh, you are not confident yet that your company's purpose is not our contribute to the performance. Please raise your hand. Oh, small people. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, people who are not confident, but people who are confident, but you are pursuing the better world, right? So today I would like to take the insights and the practical solutions, how company can from purpose to performance. That is the goal of this session. Okay, so today I like to have three discussions, starting from why and what and how, right? And uh, lastly, talking about the future. So I'd like to throw first question to Miki, uh, sorry, uh, Jim. So uh, this is my questions. Why, this is a very simple question. Why is the uh, purpose important for your company? And one more question, how can you convince the skeptics against purpose, purpose management? How you convince that kind of people? That's my first question to you. Okay, well, thank you very much for the question. Um, it's, it's wonderful to be here with all of you. I think the, there are three really key reasons why purpose matters. Um, you know, in this kind of VUCA environment, I'm sure you're working for a company that's constantly talking about being disrupted. There is no sector or industry today that is not being disrupted, does not have uh, non-traditional as well as traditional comp competitors coming after your space. Every single company I know is rethinking and reimagining what they need to do to go from their box one business to their box three business, you know, setting that future. Today, purpose matters more than ever before because we know that high growth companies and sustainable long-term performing companies have a real strong clarity around what is their role as an actor in society and in the global community in which it works and lives. Secondly, consumers are six to eight times much more likely to choose corporations that are producing products and services that actually have strong purpose behind what they do. It's not just what they do, but why they do that matters. And last but not least, and for me as chief people officer, I would say is the most important reason, employees are your most underutilized asset. And if you want to go from today to the future, you've got to activate your most underutilized asset. And employees care about whether the work they do has meaning and actually ladders up to a greater purpose. So if a corporation cannot be clear and credible about the purpose it's striving for, it's going to have a whole lot of employees that are ambling, lost, and languishing in this ever complex world. Those would be the key reasons. Okay, thank you very much. So let's go for uh, Mr. Sandeep. Uh, same question. Yeah, I think that was a wonderful answer that was already given. 
uh, I'd like to add a bit of dimension from a, let's say a more practical end of landing uh, that answer and what we are doing. Uh, delighted to be here and wonderful uh, opportunity to speak on this topic, which is, uh, which I'm really passionate about. Uh, Unilever, actually, if you look at it, uh, and I'm giving you a Unilever perspective here, uh, right from 1800s, uh, the company was founded by Lord Lever Hume, and his whole dimension of running the business was for the purpose of ensuring healthy living for people, which is why he produced the first soap and started selling it in London when London really needed it and the people really needed it. Um, I think that we certainly believe that uh, there is an external and internal dimension to having a strong purpose and running a company purposefully. And the way we voice it is company with companies with purpose last, brands with purpose grow, and people with purpose thrive. And I think that captures very well both the external and internal dimension that was being talked about just now. And the biggest challenge on being purposeful, and that's where I get in the angle of uh, you know, landing it practically, is how do you ensure that while you're being purposeful, you're also being profitable? Because at the end of the day, the reason why companies exist or why we do business is of course to make an impact in society, but also ensure that our stakeholders benefit from that. So that's what I would like to say. Thank you very much, Sandeep. I would like to ask you a lot of practical uh, examples later today, right? Okay, thank you very much. So uh, Dr. Rao, thank you very much for joining from Hyderabad, in India. Uh, I'd like to show what he's doing in India. Uh, he's operating amazing hospital in Hyderabad. Right, uh, eye institute, eye care institute, and surprisingly, half of patients don't pay for treatment free of charge, and how people covers that half of people, but still, eye hospital is making profit, right? So this is what he's doing. But firstly, I like to ask the same question to uh, Dr. Rao: What is why purpose is important? We look at it, uh, nearly half the world's population, even today, live under most shameful conditions. And a lot of it also is contributed by poor health care. And in health care, blindness and vision impairment are important causes that contribute to loss of productivity with its impact on economic productivity. So our purpose is very clear right from the beginning. That is to work towards alleviation of needless blindness a needless vision impairment throughout the world. Make our own small contribution to the global effort. This in turn will contribute to a lot of diff different areas, education, livelihoods, community development, overall healthcare, and ultimately, to the so-called sustainability development goals of the United Nations. So every one of them, better eye health can contribute. So our purpose is to make sure that we promote everything that is possible to foster and nurture better eye health from primary care to the most disadvantaged populations in the world, to care of the most complex problems at the higher levels of tertiary care. Combining that with creating human resources for this area of healthcare, 
along with relevant research that actually makes a difference. Okay, thank you very much. I was impressed by Dr. Lau is saying that still in India, 50% people go to bed who is hungry and he started to solve something. That is his starting point. That was he explained. And already purpose is there. That is his explanation at the time. So Dr. Lau, could you share more uh, in terms of business model and your efforts later today? Okay, Miki-san, uh, as a consultant of Boston Consulting, you have a lot of cases. Any uh, sharing thoughts, please? First, I would like to share that it's awful to be the last panelist to answer a question. Um, I think so much has been said, uh, and I don't want to be last the next question, uh, but no, thank you for inviting me here. Um, perhaps I'll provide two more perspectives. Um, first is, as we discuss purpose, as you said, Toru, it's been around for a long, long time. But for me, purpose is about why an organization exists. There's been a lot more narrative and dialogue in the business world and in the public sector and nonprofit about vision, which is about where a company is heading, for example, or the mission, what does the company stand for? And all of you that raised your hands probably can state your purpose. You might be able to state your mission and vision, but the day-to-day -day is about the strategy, the execution, the people, the brands. So I would like to distinguish purpose as the highest level of that cake, because that's what makes it special. And the uncertainty we have lived through in this terrible COVID period, I think has bubbled that up, which is why I think it is even more important today than ever before. Um, I do have data. I'm a, as a consultant, we love data. So as Sandeep was saying, we did actually, we have been analyzing this for a while. And there's a seminal report we did in 2017 that talked about societal impact and shareholder return. And indeed, like many reports now, there is no trade-off if you do it right. So the companies with strong purpose and mission vision, all of that connected, uh, perform two times better on a 10-year total shareholder return basis than those that don't. So that is just the economic proof. But why it doesn't get more um, spotlight, I think, is when you interview CEOs, which we have, and you ask, uh, we like this framework about the head, the heart, or the head, the hands, and the heart of transformation. So if the head is strategy, 69% of CEOs would say, that's what's really important to drive success in my company. Makes sense. I'm a strategy consultant. I love strategy. Um, that's the head. The hands is the organization, the people, the capabilities. That gets about a 40% rating. So yeah, strategy is important. Got to get my organization to execute. Sandeep, to your point, without execution, strategy is no good, but it ranked only 40. And interestingly, purpose and the heart only got 25 points. So while we talk it, and while you go to companies and it's all over the wall, I don't think it's yet really embedded into the head, heart, hand analog. And I think the successful companies actually do get all three of those right. Thank you very much. Firstly, thank you very much for defining purpose, mission, vision. Sometimes people get confused. So thank you very much for defining. And also thank you for sharing the, uh, uh, you know, uh, the explaining heart, Head, heart, and hand, and okay. Thank you. I still need to learn, but thank you very much. Uh, they have some data and facts that their purpose is bringing the result to the company. Some small example or data or facts so, to observe. Absolutely. So again, as I said, we did this report probably now five years ago, and every year the data keeps strengthening. And now, you know, Harvard Business School professors are talking about impact accounting. You know, it has become part of the lexicon. I know the Empower folks uh, that have been on the panel today are very passionate about that, as many investors are, as, as much as the uh, companies and organizations that uh, aim for doing good means, do, you know, means you can also do well financially. So I don't think there's any trade off. And, you know, it's like the question I often get in this format about, you know, is diversity important? Mm -hmm. The answer is so obvious, I don't usually answer. <laughs> so is purpose important? Absolutely. Okay. okay, thank you very much. So we have shared the importance of purpose. And then let's go for the main discussion today, how we can move from purpose to performance, right? So I like to share the very example, our practical 
our example from Jin. Uh, my question is, what are the biggest hurdles to realize purpose? Well, what are the keys to overcome? And if you have some uh, uh, good example to work well in Dixel, and right. why did it work well? That's okay. Well, thanks for the question. I might say a little bit about Lixel because people may not know the company, but you know, we were actually founded in 2011 um, on the basis of a, a merger of a whole bunch of companies. So five Japanese domestic companies came together, created Lixel in 2011, and then it went on to buy uh, about uh, three or four more companies globally, such as American Standard and Grower. Today, we're the world's leading housing and water technology company. So we make everything to build a home. You can build an entire home uh, using Lixel products in Japan. Uh, we're $17 billion turnover. For us, it was actually a business imperative. We had to ask the question, now as an amalgamated company, what are we doing here? What, what's our role as a company? You know, we, we didn't have a single core. Um, so we were smashed together and we needed to ask this question. So when I joined in 2014, you know, the mandate was, oh, please help us make, um, you know, a clear communication strategy, mm -hmm. right? Employees are confused, the investors are confused. We need to kind of help people understand who we are. So I said, well, who are we then? And I, I think one of the most important ways you can uh, tackle purpose in your organization is to go both top down, but also bottom up. I spent a lot of time working to create across silo workshops at the working level to really ask people, what, what is the most passionate thing you believe in about this company? You know, and it turns out we're super otaku about toilets. <laughs> We love to talk about flushing systems and you know, EBITDA and you know, everything, okay? So we, we love to talk about how to move water in and out of the home, how to get that really strong, strong shower spray, but save water you know, in that process, whatever it is. And so for me, purpose is really about matching sort of what are you excellent at as a company? You know, how do you make money doing that thing uniquely well? How does that skill set, that know-how, apply to a social global need? And how do you actually then make sure that the, the overlap actually also creates economic value, actually creates corporate value? And I went on this journey with executives, but also within the company to really understand that story. And one of the really interesting examples that come out of that. So in 2015, we built something called the corporate responsibility strategy. One of the pillars is actually to become a leader in tackling global sanitation and hygiene. We formulated a global social business called Sato. So it makes a $5 toilet and it's the world's first uh, social enterprise to deliver affordable, safe toilets and hand washing off-grid solutions to the 1.7 billion people in the world today who don't have access to safe sanitation and hygiene. Um, to date, we've shipped over 18 million units to 41 countries, and our social impact at the moment is 25 million people's lives have been improved by this uh, social business and still counting. So it's just an example, and of course, there's a lot of other things that have happened, like creating innovation and people wanting to participate, young talent wanting to join this team. But I guess it's just a concrete example of how when a company has clear purpose, ours is to make better homes, a reality for everyone everywhere. If you're not helping that family get their first toilet in Tanzania, only helping the family in Tokyo, you're really not making better homes a reality for everyone everywhere. And so that's really how um, that example connects to our purpose. Thank you very much. I understand that the one coin toilet is making money profitable, right? As a business model. So what toilet? A one coin toilet, yeah. <laughs> five dollar toilet, yeah. right? It's making money. It's well, the, so that's right. That's right. The really unique thing about it is it's not a philanthropic exercise because we believe, and actually we, we learn a lot from Unilever and, and their leading work in sustainability. And actually we've worked with Unilever on the Toilet Board Coalition, which is a, a Geneva-based organization. And we understand that consumers need to be respected mm -hmm. regardless of where they are in their socioeconomic base. That's right. Every consumer is making consumable decisions. So the $5 toilet is really just, I call it that, but it's priced at a point where affordability, accessibility is not an issue because that consumer needs to purchase that product. 
And when they purchase that product, they value that product. And a huge amount of our work is to educate and help consumers understand the value of this consumable product that they will then invest behind. And so just it's one a, question. Yeah. Just one more question. Many, many of companies think that uh, economically we can make it. We cannot make it. Right. But how is it possible in your company? Well, we actually use- mm, Give up. Well, so- but why not your company? Well, Sato is a very unique startup. Mm -hmm. it's, um, it's got two uh, key targets, a financial target mm -hmm. and a non-financial target or a social target. By 2025, they have to hit 100 million people impact. Okay. That's the social target. The financial target is to break even. I see. Okay? okay. So currently, they don't break even. We partner with UNICEF, JICA, and a whole bunch of different USAID and other partners the race to break even is happening now. And by 2025, whether we break even or not, we will know. But the whole point is that this has to become a PL that can sustain itself, that Lixo will invest behind the people, the resources. You know, we, we lend legal teams and compliance teams yeah. to make sure that we're doing everything compliantly in countries and everything like that. But they need to figure out the business model. Their business model is actually very unique. It's a locally make, use, and sell model. So we don't actually ship stuff around. We try to make it locally, it gets used locally, and we help build ecosystems locally, like masons and, and plumbers and installers and, and parts that toilets don't really exist in those villages or communities. We have to create that infrastructure. So we're really using a low cost model that helps us to keep costs down. Just quick questions. What was a difficult point when you make locally or how to say, our the supply chain for the whole things, right? Yeah. Not the export from Japan. But oh no, never, you yeah. You do everything. <laughs> what, what is the most important, difficult point? The most difficult point is that we're trying to reach communities that are using a toilet for the first time, mm. right? Uh, they don't know how to do So for a long time, those communities have been talked to by UNICEF and other NGOs. Um, it's really important that you don't practice open defecation. Mm -hmm. You need to actually have a safe toilet. You know, the, the UN defines the first rung of sanitation or basic sanitation as a separation between human contact and waste. Nice. And when you create that, you actually improve economic health and social value in that community. But many billions of people, many of well, all 500 million people today still practice open defecation daily. Really? And it pollutes rivers and, and farmlands. It basically hurts, you know, 500 kids die of diarrheal diseases every day, purely from unsafe drinking water and, and poor hygiene. So we know toilets matter, right? Mm -hmm. And so for us, the hardest thing was going into these communities where we have a supply of toilet solutions, mm -hmm. but actually there's no ecosystem. Who knows how to dig the pit properly? Where is the mason to install it? Who is gonna, you know, so that ecosystem is something we had to build. Nice. We had to work with Sari Sari shops who are must hardware be, shops. Must be some educational. Activity. A huge amount of education, nice. huge amount. But we work a lot with partners. You know, the key thing is that we know what we're good at, mm -hmm. but we know what we're not good at. Okay. And it's important to partner with those who are good at the other things. Right. That's how we basically will uh, efficiently move that mm -hmm. model forward. Okay, thank you very much already, very our great example. So connecting to uh, Jin's point, put purpose into business model. Uh, Sandeep, uh, this is a little bit tough question. How can a company align purpose and profit? I think anybody is doing this kind of thing very well. Uh, could you share your insight or example to doing that? Yeah, uh, so, you know, the first thing I want to say about, I, by the way, I thought that was a wonderful uh, conversation that you had uh, just now. And, uh, you know, I just loved, enjoyed hearing it and hearing that example. Uh, you know, the first thing that I want to say that if you want to uh, build purpose, meaning we talk about the two P's, purpose and profit. If you want to connect them, then purpose and profit have to be part of your business model. They cannot be in two separate buckets. Purpose cannot be an extracurricular activity that your company does. It has to be the thing that guides what you're going to do. You know, somebody talked about the why and mission and mission. Purpose comes first, and then you decide what you're going to do. Now, the thing is, uh, it has to be very authentic to what you do as a business. It can't be something which is very disconnected to the business. So like I said, we are fortunate uh, that, you know, that um, uh, William Lever, who was the founder of our company, had set the purpose as 
making cleanliness commonplace. And we have just taken that purpose, which was very authentic to us. You know, a lot of time authenticity lies in, lies in your history. So, you know, 15, 20 years ago when Paul Pullman came and really brought that to the fore, that's what we did. We just brought our history forward and we said, okay, our purpose is actually to help people to live well and live within the natural limits of the planet. Okay, so that's really what we said as our purpose. And we said, as we do this, we must make sure that we take away all inequality, which is there in terms of health or wellness, et cetera. And that will be how we will build business and do it profitably. Now, uh, there were some very bold targets that were set, uh, you know, when we start, when we got onto this journey. A lot of, there were a lot of skeptics, a lot of people didn't believe in it. And the reason I mentioned this is because unless you carry the belief of people and inspired people with you, you will never be able to turn purpose to profit. Yeah, because otherwise the skeptics will overtake. I see. Now, um, what we have done is actually our, our business is about brands and people. Every brand has a clearly defined purpose on what they are trying to achieve for society. Okay, so if there is Lifeboy, Lifeboy is a brand which wants to ensure that we impact the hygiene of billions of people so that they live a more safe and better life through by being more hygienic, especially in terms of washing hands. And we have impacted 1.3 billion people with that program and measured, has it impacted it or not? Okay. We have built the business of Domestos by ensuring that we partner with people who build toilets because when there are more toilets, there is more Domestos that is sold. And we love it that more people can go to more toilets. You know, a lot of times there is a misconception that serving purpose is only for people who don't have enough means. Actually, even people who have a lot of means have, there is things that brands can do for them. So for example, the purpose of Dove is to really ensure that we champion real beauty and take away all sense of tension and stress that comes on young children, on young girls, when they think about beauty. And the purpose of Dove is to promote real beauty. And everything that the brand does, all the products that they create, all the variants that they will create will be true to the purpose. Example, Lifeboy will never produce a soap, which is about, hey, this smells really good. It may smell very good, but that's not the reason why a consumer will buy it, even though there may be a segment that demands it. So ensuring that each of our brands is purpose-driven and all the actions that we take are purpose-driven, that's how we've been able to ensure that we build purpose to profit. Besides that, of course, we have programs which are about reducing waste, reducing plastic, reducing greenhouse gases. And we've achieved a lot in that space. We've reduced almost 1 billion euro of cost because we used less energy and less water ever since we started focusing on it. So actually, purpose can lead to profit. Purpose and profit don't come at the expense of each other. Okay, thank you very much, Sandeep. I have a lot of questions, but the time is limited. So, Nikki, uh, Sandeep is saying that uh, in Unilever, each brand has its own uh, purpose. That is amazing. And maybe you are observing a lot of companies, and there might be a company doing good. There might be some company doing many efforts, but couldn't achieve. If you took the run from uh, uh, Sandeep and combine your our insights of good mm -hmm. company or our improving company. Are there any comments on that? Sure. Well, Sandeep, I think, you know, Paul Pullman and what Unilever has done is one of, you know, not just a good practice, but it's truly a best practice that we see not only in the consumer products business, but around the world. And, you know, Paul has been talking about it at the forefront, whether it's a stage like this or Davos for indeed over a decade. So I do think that some of this is all about the leadership and how the person at the very top has to believe it. Although, Tori, I would also say that, if I may, there's also a lot out there that's not working. 
right? So mm. when, and our research would suggest this purpose stuff really doesn't work for three reasons. Uh, the first is it's just not authentic. You know, you can't have something on the wall that doesn't feel like it's a reality in the company, which may seem obvious, but I would ur you know, urge you to Google and pick some of your favorite companies and read it and say, hmm, is that what they really stand for? And is that why employees work at that company? Um, the second is that connection or disconnection, you know, with the vision and mission of the company, the purpose can sound lovely, but if they're actual activities on a day-to-day -day basis, so picking up Sandeep's response, um, you know, the Dove campaign has changed the world of advertising uh, in a dramatic way around the authentic self. That was frame breaking. Beauty, personal care was all about making you look perfect for years. And that took a lot of guts. So I do think that purpose has to align with that strategy uh, and the execution of it. Otherwise, it becomes inauthentic. And the last one, uh, and Jun said this at the very beginning, it is something that obviously has to come top down from a Paul Pullman type person, but it also has to be believed by the new employees. Yeah. If yeah. you survey employees around the world, and we do this uh, 200,000 employee survey every uh, three years, it is such an important part of what the next generation is looking for. So I think it can go wrong pretty quickly yeah. if you don't stay with it. Thank you very much. I'm not a game but before that, Dr. Lau, thank you for waiting. So I'd like to ask you, what, why that also in India, amazing business model, already 30 years ago, how do people don't pay? Then still profitable. Why was it possible in India? We can tell us the secret of India, Dr. Lau, please. There is no secret in India, per se. I think it's the application of uh, well-known sustainability principles in a proper way that has led to this uh, path. If you look at it, when we started, our, uh, our vision was to reconcile excellence with equity in eye care so that all may see. That's been our vision for the past 35 years. Mm -hmm. And by following that and developing appropriate strategies to attain that purpose, we have succeeded over the past 35 years of serving nearly 33 million people. The way we do it is, we have done an informal economic survey of the populations. India has been traditionally classified as uh, four socioeconomic categories. One is the really least fortunate, the bottom 30 to 40%. And then at the top, we have a low middle class. This is the group, one day at a time kind of group. The next is the upper middle class who do reasonably well, and then the very affluent. So what we did was when we structured our fee structure for our services, we developed a pricing model that is appropriate to each of those categories. Mm -hmm. So the bottom part, the least privileged in the community, entirely at no cost because they don't even have those two square meals a day, let alone thinking about spending money for healthcare. So then the other paying side, we have three tiers based on their socioeconomic status. And they choose, we don't tell them what they should be paying for. Each of those classes, the person who is seeking service chooses. And by doing that, we have realized that in the last 34 and a half years, we have performed 54% of all our surgical services, surgical procedures at no cost to the patient. Even while doing that, we were able to recover anywhere between 110 to 120% cost recovery for all our operating expenses. So that's our aim, to operationally to become self-sustaining while serving everybody without denying any service related to eye care to anybody 
however the complex the problem might be and however complex the care might be and whatever the cost might be. And we have proven again and again that this model works. There are several factors that contributed to it. One is the relatively philanthropic spirit of the ophthalmologist community in India. It's been our tradition for many, many years, over five, six decades, that a lot of eye care services have been provided at no cost to the people. Because India is the home of nearly 25% of the blind, a largest magnitude of the problem of blindness in the world. And a lot of them are economically underprivileged. Unless we develop models that can really pay attention to those needs, we can never tackle the problem. By applying these models and replicating this across the country, India is now leading the developing world in terms of handling the problem of blindness and the vision impairment, and it's actually a model for the world. The model that we have developed in some sense is also a model for the developed world where a lot of the underprivileged are getting no services at all, all the way from the US to many other countries in the world who are very privileged economically, but 15 to 20% of the people don't get any good healthcare services. So we often talk of the words used very loosely, equity and equality. In practice, uh, it doesn't happen really on the ground. And what we try to prove is, in fact, it is possible to provide a high quality care in an equitable fashion, and yet becoming economically or financially self-sustained. But of course, I agree that for all the capital needs or for the expansion programs, we depend on philanthropy, we depend on grants, and that, in I, my belief is there's plenty of money to go around if we have good programs uh, to do. There's more, more money available to good programs than there are good programs available for the money out there. So that's how our economic model worked and that's how we could create our uh, sustainability model. Okay, Dr. Rao, thank you very much. Just a quick question. What was the most difficult point when you make this business model? Just one word, please. Most difficult thing when you make this business model in your country. Just, just one word. One word for my model. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Sorry, my question was bad. So, uh, Mitch, some are just a question. Are medical services or consumer services it easy to make? It easy to think about the purpose. An industry like oil industry, tobacco industry, alcohol industry, it may not be easy to think about progress. Are there any suggestions to the industries <laughs> how they make good progress? Okay. How many people here are from the tobacco or oil or spirits business? Um, no, seriously. Look, every company has to have a purpose to succeed. There are category unique dynamics, but I think it starts with what is it that your company is about? What product, what sector? And you know, taking fossil fuels as an example, we may have less of it around the world, but we, will, we need stuff to keep our lights on today. So I think it does come back to portfolio of people and the cash, right? So if these tobacco companies make a lot of cash, the successful ones, I believe, will continue to look for new business to invest in. Um, I would again urge you to just check out some of their purpose and mission and vision statements. Pick any one of those categories and you can tell who might be at the leading edge to figure out what the new company looks like. Kodak's not around, but Fujifilm is. Mm. That's an interesting example. Mm. I did have a favorite um, purpose statement that I wanted to read though, especially now because tech companies too are being questioned about their purpose given data privacy issues and whatnot. So Microsoft's, uh, Nadella's purpose, empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. I think that's kind of cool. Mm. Now, when they get confronted by the issues that are in the press today, 
about how much data should they have, should they use and whatnot. I, I suspect that the whole company will be behind them to figure it out, to do the right thing. And so I think that's the way I would answer your difficult question about some difficult categories that may not be aligned with the purpose and values of what the world is, where the world is headed to at this time. So thank you very much. So we have five minutes, and then after that, we open up the q and So I have a quick question for the future. Are Sandy, are you covering the Middle East and the Central Asia, right? Are there any specific issues in terms of your territories, right? The Arabic countries, Middle East, and Central Asia. Any are issues or the, your our future, our future plan, whatever? Could you, could you share that? Yeah. Thanks for that question. And it speaks to my heart because, you know, in my career, I've worked in so many different countries and regions. And I started working for this region, uh, you know, about uh, 18 months ago. And uh, what strikes me here is, uh, we have more than half the population below the age of 25. So, you know, a very, very young population that we have in our region. The second is the region has been over the years been going through a metamorphosis. And a lot of it, you know, it is in the news in terms of what is happening in politics, what is happening in society. One of the big things that uh, really interests us is how uh, there is a greater sense of women wanting to be empowered and there's a greater sense of society also wanting women to have even greater empowerment and these are a couple of issues which are very authentically connected to our brands and we want to use with the purpose of our brands to see how we can drive change uh, in society in line with what society needs and the beauty of doing something or you know, going after wanting to create something which society wants and you become part of is that you find a lot of partners who are much more than willing to help you, partner you, help you to achieve that goal. So I'm super excited about that and so is my team to say that how can we serve the young people well and how can we, through our brands, create a greater sense of empowerment for our women? So, for example, uh, you know, we are completely unstereotyping the kind of advertising that we are running on many of our beauty brands. There was a very typical, you know, kind of, uh, uh, let's say, visualization of beauty that used to happen in advertising. So we've changed that completely. We've also made, uh, you know, uh, kept a target in our mind that we should have more and more of our beauty brands. Actually, the advertising for that should be created by women rather than men. So whether it is the script writing or whether it is even the production. So we are doing even a lot of that in that space, uh, you know, to do it. The last thing, of course, is that um, this region is as environment conscious as any other region in the world. And we are partnering with the governments here with our program of um, less plastic, better plastic, and no plastic on our packaging to ensure that we can create industry benchmarks uh, in terms of you know, how to and create an ecosystem, which will not only enable us, but enable other industries and even enable our competitors to be able to take uh, our packaging to consumers in a more responsible way. Thank you very much. Gee, quick, quick. Are you from Japanese company? Can you talk about a little bit about Japanese context? or the Japanese people, Japanese company, any suggestions or whatever? <laughs> okay. um, I, think, I think Japanese companies already naturally practice stakeholder capitalism. Um, the West is now talking a lot about it. You know, they're shifting from shareholders to stakeholders, but Japanese companies aren't really about the quarter to quarter performance. It's always been about the generation to generation performance. And so, you know, it's kind of an untapped market, I think. Japanese companies have a tremendous opportunity uh, to articulate what they already are practicing as a purpose. They may not call it that. You know, when I came to Lixel, we had something called Lixel Way, right? But we had to work on that. You know, was the Lixel Way really what we were? So articulating the true purpose and going through the exercise of that. 
and getting to the unique nub of it. It's, it's harder than you think. And for us, you know, it took us years to get to our purpose statement, if you will. And I think that that process was important because having some fancy team make it up isn't useful. It becomes the poster on the wall, right? Um, once you've articulated, it's assimilating it. How do you actually embed it into the way that you set up your businesses, um, actually set your performance targets and your priorities? Leadership matters. You know, I'm very lucky because I work for, for a company with a CEO and an executive team that's super aligned to the importance of purpose and really speaks to it. So you've got a chief digital officer who will talk about purpose and why therefore the infrastructure improvement project's critical. You know, if, if, if leaders and managers can connect the purpose to the work of the procurement team or the EHS team or the manufacturing site, it brings to life that purpose. And that's the activate part. I think it's really important that the purpose is lived inside rather than talked about outside. Um, it will naturally become a really powerful story for you for talent acquisition and for reputation building, but it really miss, must be authentic and it must be activated and living inside first. I think Japanese companies have a tremendous opportunity. Activation, activation, activation. Yes. Three A's. <laughs> Three A's. So, maybe quickly, uh, company like also concerned in blue, how your farm should change because clients are changing, the start of changing, maybe your way of consulting must be changed. Are there any changes in Boston consulting? So we have to change before our clients change. So that's one thing to stay uh, thriving in the our business. Um, so I was actually a part of the leadership team, their executive committee that uh, developed our purpose statement. And it's uh, unlocking the potential of those that advance the world. There are five pillars, starting with insight delight leading with integrity. I, I can recite everything and go do it backwards because it's now so much a part of me, but it starts there, I think, in terms of what do our clients want and how do they see us versus our competition? What do our alumni see us about? We have, I think, oh, we're a small company in the scheme of the many large corporates that are here today, 20,000 employees, 29,000 alumni. And then the other stakeholders, obviously, that are in the world that we're trying to influence. So we did a ton of research because mm. we love data. And we looked at what we stood for and what we didn't. And then the internal processes follow. So what needs to change? I, don't, I wouldn't limit this to what we're doing. But I would say that we are paying particular attention around leading with integrity um, and, and uh, you know, there's just a lot of stuff that happens in the world, right? The CEOs to don't always work on strategy. I think a majority of the time goes to fighting crises. And this, the last two years have been about crisis management. But I do think that setting very clear, I guess in the Japanese context, perhaps many of you are golfers, but that OB zone is very important. And so being a member of the executive committee, I've, I've seen a lot of business that we just did not do and whether they are sectors or topics or institutions that we chose not to work with, you know, um, that I think is important. And honestly, I think we've been always implicitly doing that, but it has to be much more explicit now. And I think that is the wave of, you know, not just uh, our industry, but industries at large. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for waiting. So let's open up the other session. Uh, any Questions, maybe I'll take two or three, if you want. Yeah. Okay, so please. Yeah, hi, uh, Roman Caillot with SIPA Partners. I have a question for Miki, actually, um, to follow up on what you just said. I thought it was very interesting what you just said about the importance of stating what you do and what you don't do. And so from that perspective, we are in a world which is increasingly um, divided including in terms of uh, you know, geographies and geopolitics. And I think there are a lot of discussions around decoupling, et cetera. And so from that perspective, um, we also see these conversations around engagement to promote change versus some type of boycott because there are things that are not acceptable. Mm -hmm. So how do you navigate that? Because I, you know, in certain difficult circumstances, engaging can be seen as, as essential. So what type of principles do you use to guide the engagements versus disengagement. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, very carefully is the answer uh, with a lot of debate and discussion. So um, I 
can cite uh, a, a few examples around um, things we chose not to do and what were the business consequences. And it goes through a vote and we decide go, no go. And that happens at the highest level. So it could be, for example, you mentioned geographies. We do not do um, defense strategy, but if it is work to help um, female unemployment in the Middle East, or youth unemployment in a particular country in the Middle East, which is rampant, we will work for that government. So I think there are geographic considerations, topic considerations, and ultimately whether we have a mutual relationship of trust, right? Because um, they have to trust us, we also have to trust them. And so um, again, the, the, the world and the crisis we've all been thrown into I think has accelerated this kind of thinking. And I know that it is an active conversation, again, not only in our business, uh, but in boardrooms around the world. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you very much. So one here, and any, any other questions? I'd like to take two or six. Okay, one, two, three. So please take two questions for the Okay. Um, at the same time, we've seen an increase in the percentage of consumers that define themselves as belief-driven buyers. We've seen falling rates in participation at elections and challenges to the concept of democracy as it exists at the moment. Are we seeing a phenomenon where people are giving up or disappointed in government's ability to be able to solve the problems of the world just because they are so big and are now using a dollar vote to influence um, influence society through the corporations that are doing good work. Okay, thank you very much. So one more. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I, was, I was thinking about the performance, uh, purpose to performance, and uh, of course the performance uh, purpose should be the uh, contribute to the society. But based on that purpose, um, if we set the um, right pur uh, purpose, then everything, the organization skills or the uh, operation will be aligned. And that will make the you know, organization very strong. So, but I, I, I wanted to, yeah, how, how to align and, and right, 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 right. So I think that's the most, most important thing. All right, thank you very much. So uh, for government, uh, so I have some data. Um, <laughs> Thank God. You know, during COVID, we um, even in Japan, we interviewed about 10,000 consumers every other month to say, how are you feeling? How are you feeling about the government? How are you feeling about consumption? Do you, how do you feel about your livelihood and all of that? And it was very clear in terms of the trust in government. And by the way, Ross, I mean, the Edelman reports are pretty good about yeah, this yeah, too. Yeah. So you probably have data too. Uh, but um, the trust level actually correlated very strongly with the response to COVID by that government. So Japanese sentiment, not so good for a while because we were so slow amongst the you know, major OECD nations to get the vaccine as Parley Kono-san talked about earlier today. But later on, it, it, it bumped up. And I, so I think cons consumers, uh, citizens are very smart in saying, what have you done for me lately? And I trust you. When you see the data now in Russia, where the Russian consumers don't want to get the vaccine because they don't trust the government. So I do think that it is a very country specific situation. And this COVID example, I think is the clearest example of correlation of what government policy did or didn't do for me as a citizen. Um, yeah, so that would be the, uh, at least the BCG version of the answer. And I'm sure I'd be <laughs> curious to hear about the Edelman version later as well. <laughs> And open to the with issues. Uh, may I ask Sandeep to answer the question about how to our the global advantage of capabilities to, to deliver the, our, our, our performance? Yeah, I think uh, it starts with um, having a belief that uh, purpose that you cannot profit and you cannot perform unless you have a purpose. And in the world of today, and I think the previous question also alluded to that a bit, that uh, unless you do not have an authentic purpose and you are purpose-led, you cannot be future fit to, to, to actually, uh, and, and, and I'm using the word future fit 
and fit means uh, you have to be a healthy company a healthy organization where people would want to work for you and where people and where consumers would want to buy your brands so you cannot be future fit if you are not purpose led so for me the the question itself and i'm not trying to demean the question but i want to make a point that the question itself in today's world hypothetical in the world 15 years ago it was not hypothetical because in 15 years ago people were wondering can you have purpose and can you profit but in today's world you cannot profit unless you are purpose led think quick chief people of yes <laughs> um about how to align the organization yeah yeah i i think it is really important to assimilate the purpose i mean for us at lixo we make sure that it's in built into various governance processes so you know i sit on the corporate responsibility committee or the investment committee we make very clear that purpose is part of the conversation it's not an embarrassing statement you wouldn't make that statement and people look at you like you're cheesy a lot of it is about the culture that you create right and it starts with leaders um in some companies i have worked for in the past if you did speak to the purpose you were kind of a nerd or that was a cheesy thing to do um but at lixo it's very much um in the conversation as it were purpose is very much in the conversation and sometimes it's used to rebut certain ideas or certain proposals um and i i think it is because of just our unique legacy as a company that really needed to search for you know who we are and why we exist that we um we we're, we're so reinforcing of the statement so it's not embarrassing to be a mid level manager and talk to why we have to do this versus that and how that actually helps to reinforce or realize our purpose. And so it really needs to be a statement that um acts as a kind of um true north or a guidepost. And I can't emphasize how important it is to create that culture of openness to speak to the purpose and to ask questions about it. Well, how exactly does our the work that our team, you know, that we do here in in retail sales, how does that actually help contribute to the purpose? And managers are supported by hr and by our leaders how to address that question because it's actually maybe tougher than you think if you're a large corporation like us 60,000 employees in 150 you know countries around the world and in japan alone we have 30,000 employees you know not everyone understands how it connects so it's it's like that john f kennedy story where he's walking down the hallway of nasa and he asks the janitor who's cleaning the hallway so what do you do around here and he says i help put a man on the moon right i think strategic alignment is really critical to activating that purpose in the organization and having it pull through into the performance and if i can quickly add to that uh, you know i love the name sorry if i can quickly add to that it is that you know you have to have metrics which show you that you are moving towards okay. so it's not wishy washy stuff yes. <laughs> so you know we have very specific metrics by brand and for the full company which show everybody that what we say is what we do is what we measure and what leads to profit i think that link the stronger it becomes the more people contribute uh, towards it thank you very much so it's that uh, it's time to close but i like to ask dr rao from hyderabad india for the closing remarks to so please give us your final message in terms of purpose management Dr. Lau, you are the last one to talk. <laughs> oh, Dr. Lau, please unmute. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate uh, this morning. Uh, it's been very interesting and uh, a lot of uh, learning for me from these different leaders. I think it's whether it's individual level. on an organization level if one has purpose and the, the other name for that could be de destination what is the destination of each of the organizations or the individuals if you are clear about that then i think the, the, the path to achieve that purpose or reach that destination becomes very clear and once you know the purpose and you know the way how to get there and develop the appropriate strategy and put all the logistics in place to achieve that it becomes easier 
Along the way, there will be several hurdles, several difficulties, and one should be prepared to surmount all those challenges. But I think probably healthcare is one area where you face most challenges compared to many other sectors. And if one is prepared to face those challenges, find appropriate solutions, one could certainly achieve the purpose. And there is no greater satisfac satisfaction than achieving the purpose of an individual or organization. Okay, thank you very much. So this next of these last, last three, very important. Okay, so time is up, and then give big hands to the great panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>